lot of our work is generated by our desire to make work in public spaces. And, and this is a stupid project that we've just finished. <laughs> this is um, a live voice to video. I mean, what a good way to start, I thought. Um, one of the epic speeches of Design in Darba 2012. Um, what's actually happening there is, uh, that's not pre-recorded, I'm looking into a screen and every time I go like this, it's going like that, so it's kind of a lot of fun, but it's completely useless. Anyway. <laughs> so, we're a group of artists. Uh, we work together, we make public art. I'm going to tell you very, very quickly just a couple of moments of the history and why. It'll probably make a bit more sense if I do that. Um, my family are, like most, most people in the family are musicians. That's not a question of quality, that's a question of getting stuck in and making sound. Um, it doesn't really matter so much if you're any good, but it's much more important that you actually get stuck in and you do your, and you, you know, you play your, your, your guitar or you bang your drum or whatever it is that you're, you're doing. Um, and I think that's a kind of philosophy that's, that's, that I've taken very much into, into Grey World's work. I remember distinctly, I absolutely remember distinctly the day when I realised that other kids didn't have a dad who had a Andrew's putting on his shoes song or a, oh, he's going to have a piece of toast now tune. Um, uh, yeah, I just thought this was kind of what dads did. But anyway, you know, in our family, you, you, in our family, you did that, and that's what you do. Um, and if somebody comes around for dinner, if I'd have brought a kid home from school and the music was played, it really doesn't matter, like I say, that you're particularly good, but the ability to get stuck in and enjoy yourself doing it and to laugh, to giggle, shout, there's lots of noise going on. And that's really what Greywald was about. Greywald, I think the philosophy between the work that we, in the work that we were making was really about getting involved. I, d I didn't do any art training. I didn't go to art school. I left school when I was 17 um, with this desire really to, well, actually, first of all, to be a rock star, which went <laughs> hopelessly wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, after real, I realised that, yeah, the quality was sorely lacking in my rock star ambitions, I started to make installations really in urban spaces which used a lot of sound, and that was really the basis of a lot of the early stuff. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I mean, the first installation, and in some ways, probably the, the best thing that we ever did, you know, as a child, you pick up a stick and you run it along railings and get that lovely ch -ch 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 sound. Well, we took a set of railings and we tuned them. So when you ran a stick along it, it played The Girl from Ipanema. Um, now, for me, and in many ways, it's the best thing we've ever done. It's important in, in a lot of ways because of what it is, but also because of what it isn't. When you think of what public art is, for many, and for me, certainly growing up, public art was a bronze guy on a horse holding a sword, you know, or a, a highly polished rock somewhere, you know, um, perhaps with a little text, maybe an inscription in Latin, you know. I mean, for some reason, they've always got inscriptions in Latin. I'm not entirely sure why. Now, uh, this is a work of public art from our point of view, you know, and it, for that moment of joy of running your stick along it, it's kind of gleeful, but it's also something that stops you getting into the park, you can chain your bike to it, you know, it's a set of railings. And so this is a, a philosophy, was a good sort of a flag in the ground to what Greyward was, was really interested in. Um, we did um, a bunch of projects, so because of the sound basis of, 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 uh, of my history, we did a lot of projects which, which were sound based. This is the layer, this is a series of installations, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to go quickly over the early stuff, but this was a carpet over a bridge in, the, in uh, Ireland, over the Liffey. Uh, tiny little sensors embedded in the bridge made sound as you walked across them. So as you walk across this bridge, you walk through crunchy snow, or you splosh through water, or you walk through crunchy leaves. Um, this was um, a, uh, a permanent version at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is in the north of England. Uh, this area looks like some kind of game field. You move across it, and as you move across that field there, you generate the sound environment of a game being played. So as you move, sound comes from around. As you sit on the bench, you generate the sound environment of an audience watching this game. It's important to realise that this is not stand in the corner, trigger sound A, stand in the corner, trigger, trigger sound B. These are generative sound environments that create based on the positions that you, that you move and the, and the mood of the computer at the time. But I'm going to show you a little bit more of these things as we kind of progress. Um, we realised kind of pretty early on that we live in this world of, 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 of a, visual, a really strongly visual world and, and you really desperately need some kind of visual clue, even if you're making a sound installation. You know, um, we did an installation in Paris a long time ago. I thought it was a brilliant idea. It was 
pretty rubbish, actually. But at the time, I thought I'd come up with this great idea. The idea was in this giant shopping centre that we'd have microphones that were hidden all through the shopping centre, one on table number four in the supermarket, one in, the, in McDonald's, one outside the supermarket, one in the cinema, and that you go into a dark room and free, liberated from the terrible visual pollution that we have to survive in all the time in urban cities. All of the sounds would be piped into this dark room so you could have a consumer experience without having to see anything. I thought this was brilliant. Unfortunately, people would walk into the dark room, think we hadn't set it up yet, and then leave the room. Um, this became a bit of a major fail. Um, and then one of the people at Grey World had this brilliant idea. We went out, bought some gold frames, put the gold frames around the speakers, suddenly we had an art show. Um, people would walk in, they'd see these gold frame speakers, they would look at the speaker, and in the act of looking at the speaker, they would actually focus, focus their ear on what they, were, what they were hearing. And suddenly the sound installation worked and it became uh, something that people could really experience. And that's why the carpet I just showed you is blue. I mean, there is no real nece necessary need for us to have a carpet at all. But with that blue carpet, we signify that something special has happened. And that's really, really important. We realized very, very quickly that the visual element of these things was, was, was vital. So we've, we did a lot of stuff. I mean, things like the layer were done with permission, but the railings, we used to sneak out. Neil and I were sitting down there. We used to sneak out and um, do these without permission. Uh, as, as you all know, if you're starting out as a, an artist or a designer, finding someone to pay you to do what you love is very difficult. Um, so we thought, sod it, we'll do it anyway, um, which was great. But we got chased a few too many times uh, from tuning the railings. So we thought we'd start get a bit more, um, a bit more official about things. This is a little experiment that we made a while ago after a nice Chinese meal. We realized, we've got a tank of water, we started to play around with this tank of water. We realized, you know the, the pump that they put into the tank that, that produces the air bubbles? We realized, you know, here, this, we've, just got, we've just built one of these in the bottom and it's shooting out little air bubbles. But we realized that if you fire them in a certain order, you could probably get text messages floating up as bubbles in the tank. So we started to make this. This is a very, as you can see, this is a very ugly prototype. But uh, can you see the number three floating up? OK. Now, this is, we did this in 2003, 2004. We don't normally work this way, but it was just such a delicious thing. What the hell can we do with this? So we started to muck around with it. And obviously, we had to call this bubble jet printer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> um, so we started to think, you know, what can we do, what can we do with this thing? And at the same time, and I know this is rather surreal, but at the same time, although we had a reputation at this point for doing stuff in public spaces, um, our stuff was quite grand. I'm kind of zipping up about time-wise, but our stuff got quite grand. The London Stock Exchange called up and they said, we want something really grand to signify that the London Stock Exchange market has, has opened. Um, so I was obsessing with tanks of water at the time. Um, I was like, give them a 30 meter tank of water, it'll be amazing. Um, Fortunately, I was stopped from actually pitching that. Someone said, I just don't think it's macho enough for the London Stock Exchange. But what we did propose them was this. Um, I'll show you. This is a video that we made to show them how it works. Now, I'd be very interested to hear if you guys can, un can, can get it, because the bankers were utterly inscrutable. They had no idea what they thought of it. Basically, you've got a base on the floor, 81 cables from that base right up to the ceiling, eight stories high in the air. And on each cable, you've got nine balls, right? So you've got nine times nine times nine balls, 729 balls. And this, think of this as being directly related to the, to the tank of water, like a 3D tank of water. We can now send those balls anywhere we want, height-wise, in the atrium. So in that way, we can model anything. It's like an infinite sculpture. Do you see what I mean? Nod your head. Yeah, okay, cool, 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 cool. So um, this is the video that we used to kind of explain to them how it would work. Um, I'll just sniff it forward a bit and you'll kind of get an idea. See on the right-hand side here, this is a kind of exploded view of all eight stories of all the spheres raining up and down. We kind of thought, somewhat stupidly perhaps, that the shapes that came out of it would be the exciting thing. And it, I mean, in fact, here on the right-hand side, you can see out of the noise just coming these simple planes. But quickly it became clear that it's the tweening, in-between states that are quite exciting. You see here, the spheres are, are, getting, are coming back down to Earth, but as they do, some are being left behind. Why, I hear you ask. 
because it's going to write the word London. Ah. <laughs> so, so basically we proposed this to them and they were like, yeah, we'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, we're thinking about that. That's no problem. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, no, stop calling us. We're totally thinking about it. Yeah, we're going to think about that. I tell you what, Andrew, stop calling. Uh, we are thinking about it. There's no need to call us up anymore. We're thinking about it. Um, and then on the 1st of February 2004, they called up and they went, right, we're ready. And we were like, okay, cool. And when do you need it by? They were like, June the 24th. We're like, what? June the, that's ridiculous. June the 24th is ridiculous. I mean, June the 24th was like uh, less than six months' time. It was massively stressful. They said the other trouble, the other problem is, Obviously, you can't work during the day because obviously we're, a, we're, a, you know, we're with a London Stock Exchange. You can't work during the day. So you'll have to work from 8 p.m. till 3 a.m. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, no problem. Oh, and the other thing is the Queen will be opening it um, on the 24th uh, with an estimated global audience of 65 million people. So we were like, no pressure. No pressure at all. That's the, that's the way we like to work. And uh, this is what happened. After two centuries of trading at the same site in the City of London, the Stock Exchange is moving to a striking new home next to St Paul's Cathedral. The Queen opened the building today, with all eyes on the rather beguiling work of art which forms the centrepiece of the new Stock Exchange, as June Kelly now explains. So, Your Majesty, if you would put your hand on this ball, then the source should come to life. It was perhaps one of the most unusual invitations the Queen has ever received. She pressed one electronic ball and more than 700 others suspended on metal cables began to move. The balls are the centrepiece and talking point of the new Stock Exchange building. My balls what have been on TV every morning for months. create something which makes physical the ephemeral nature of the stock market for many yeah, no, no, no. Right, you now. Place compare with the old stock exchange. The other nice this thing about them about is that each one is individually illuminated, so you can do things. You see the up arrow scrolling behind. Being ahead of competition. And then it would and physically break off and become a physical arrow in space. That's how they do it in the 20th century. Close very, business very nice. tonight on the New York Stock Exchange. So while New York has its bell in London, it will be the balls which will signify the start and end of trading. Well, it's several hours since trading ceased and the balls are now resting for the night. The arrow indicates that the market's closed up today. This has truly been a significant day for the Stock Exchange. Yes. A whole Absolutely. new era for the City of London. Thank you very much. June Kelly, BBC <laughs> News at the Stock Exchange. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the balls sequence of our career was um, a very interesting one and it was, it was, it was great. I mean, we, I've got to tell you, it... You know, we've been working in public spaces for years, years and years and years and years and years. Um, and uh, we became the people that did the, the balls at the Stock Exchange. Um, the Queen touched my balls, etc. So, the, um, <laughs> now, this was great. I mean, and, and it gave us lots of opportunities to do artworks. Unfortunately, for a while, it gave us lots of opportunities to hang expensive things in Atria. Now, I'm not complaining. I don't want to, like I said to my dad, Dad, I'm so frustrated. I want to work in public spaces. And all we'd get is his commission in Atria. And he was like... Well, that's a nice problem to have, isn't it, son? <laughs> Pass the vinegar. You know, he was. Um, yeah, he 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 just he just made me realise what exactly I was saying. But for a little section anyway, it was rather frustrating. We were doing a lot of stuff, which was in 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 Atria, so that we were doing projects that three thousand lawyers were seeing, rather than hum other humans, human other humans. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and this is one of them during the our Atrium world phase. Um, you know, I, basically, I always wanted to be a magician when I was a kid. I, I, again, I wasn't very good at it, but I loved the, I loved the, the magic of it. I loved the, the colour of it. And you guys know the bunches of flowers that you can put up your sleeve, yeah? So they're, when they're up your sleeve, they're quite small. When you pull them out, pfft, big bunch of colourful flowers. And I, I love these. I've got lots of these in my studio. Uh, and I annoy people all the time by pulling them out. And OK, Andrew, we've seen that. Do it again. <laughs> um, and I, you know, absolutely love them. We thought, I was just having a project, having an idea, we were thinking, okay, imagine that you're in a public space, say, and there was a wall and there was a tiny little hole, but behind that tiny little hole was a bunch of these flowers, right? Because you could kind of come out a little bit like an anemone. And then imagine if we had like 10,000 holes and like 10,000 bunches of flowers. So there's our little bunch of flowers. Now we were, I was thinking, this is interesting. You know, imagine that you, this, this proposal actually was originally for a train station, you'll see in a minute. The idea would be that you're on a train 
and you pull into the station. As you do, the station goes completely insane. There's a huge fucking great big mountains of flowers. It's like huge kind of rolling fields and what have you. And, and you turn to your friend and you go, Jesus, look at that. And your friend looks out the window and there's nothing at all. They've all gone back in the holes. <laughs> that was, you know, this was the major proposal. And this was, now this was the video that we made for this originally. Um, and we got quite far. The idea of this, uh, of, this, of this particular version was that we'd also have a kind of kiosk somewhere on the platform. See this thing here? And so you're bored and you could go over and you could just kind of, you know, doodle or whatever and watch your signature or your doodle blossom on the other side of the, of the station. What happened was they gave us a little bit of money. We bought 10, 12,000 bunches of flowers and then they went bankrupt. And we ended up with a, a garage in Bethnal Green, a poor part of London, with 10, 12,000 bunches of flowers which created its own unique problems. Um, atrium world phase started, big atrium, what could we do? So we reappropriated that into this. It's a really, really simple version, sort of variation, if you like, of, of it. This is an 11 story atrium. These are the flowers that you've seen, only they're kind of redesigned so they're a bit more like an umbrella. If you imagine that I'm the inside of the umbrella, you can see the colorful sides of it, but when the umbrella is closed, you don't see any color at all. This is a huge, huge atrium. When you're in the glass lift and you go up inside the atrium, all the flowers blossom to follow the lift as you rise. Um, and there's a little, there's a, what's called an LDR, a, a light dependent resistor at the top. And when it gets sunny, all the flowers blossom upwards to, to reach the sun. So this is our way we kind of reappropriated our, our flower phase. Now this one we call Bloom. Um, the bridge project we called Bridge. Um, <laughs> The railings project we called railings. Uh, yeah, there's a theme coming on here. You know, I've got, we've got artist friends who would have called this Momentary Lapse of Reason, part seven. <laughs> Untitled. Um, I always thought if you need a really clever name, you're probably missing something out on the artwork. It's just the way we've always looked at it. So yeah, Bloom. Um, so we started doing this, we started doing some kind of, some kind of um, more visual stuff. I'd realized we, you know, we were so f sort of fiercely soundy that it was potentially a little bit um, inversely snobby, I suppose, because there was, you know, so much fun to be had with, um, with, with, with the eyes, if you like. Um, and, and we started to, to experiment with, okay, public art in urban spaces. I mean, a lot of what we've done is to reappropriate what's already there. We reappropriate, I mean, some, a guy called me up a little while ago and he said, will you speak at our conference? I was like, sure, I'm a show off, no problem. Uh, and he said, he said, I said, what's the conference about? He went, it's about obsession. And I was like, oh shit. How does he know about that? Um, <laughs> and he, anyway, it turns out that he thought I was obsessed with park benches. Uh, I said to him, mate, what the hell are you talking about? That's a, that's a very private fetish you got there. Um, Anyway, he goes, no, he goes, actually, I've just looked down the list of the artworks that you've made, and you've got park benches in over eight of them, eight or nine of them. And I was like, oh, fuck, he's right. He's absolutely right. I never really thought of that. To me, the park bench is such a wonderful metaphor for social life and urban life and social space. You know, the park bench is where you sit and have your lunch. It's where you meet your girlfriend. It's where you argue with your girlfriend. It's where you sleep on the bench when she throws you out of the house. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the whole world is, lives out on a park bench, and we've done lots and lots of projects with park benches, and a lot of grey world stuff really has reappropriated what you'd find in urban space. So park benches, railings, flooring, bollards, all kinds of stuff. We had never reappropriated public art as an element. I thought, this is kind of interesting. We get asked a lot to do projects um, where they'll make a new building, and they'll, they want the art outside, and there's usually a little square where they expect the statue to go, which you can imagine is a bit of a provocation to us. You know, we don't do statues, what are you talking about? But somebody, somebody asked us to do one outside of Tate Modern, and uh, we decided, okay, what would Greywood do if Greywood was gonna make a, a piece of, you know, traditional public art? Um, and I'll show you, this is a, a statue outside of Tate Modern. It's called Monument to the Unknown Artist, was wanted to make a grand statement about public art. He's, he's only a paintbrush having a look. But when you walk past him, he has a look at you, and then he tries to copy the pose that you're in before going back to being a, uh, a statue. He's actually a fully animatronic uh, little... Pro in fact, I'm going to just show you this. This is... Anyone speaks Spanish, you'll understand what he's saying. Es lo que está deteniendo a transeúntes y automóviles en Londres, colocando una sonrisa en sus rostros. Se trata de esta estatua de casi 7 metros de altura titulada 
el monumento al artista desconocido. Pero tiene algo muy particular. Se mueve. Y no solo aleatoriamente, sino que por medio de una cámara que apunta a la persona que se ha detenido a verla. It does look a bit like Terminator with his clothes off. Now, it's really, it was really important. To, that's the size of his shoes. His shoes are like this big. So the figure himself is actually six meters tall. Um, he's a monster and, you know, he's a bronze statue. He doesn't move, he doesn't appear to move, he stands there very, very still. But then suddenly you realize that he's looked at you and winked and then gone back to being a statue again. And look, this is an area where there are a lot of humans who paint themselves like statues and pretend to be statues. And here we've got a statue who's actually pretending to be human. I think it's just, it's got a, it's got a lot of potential. That's just him having a little test. Um, and I'm just, I'm just going to skip through this. I, I'm, I'm also going to tell you a rude story. Um, if anybody is of a sensitive nature, possibly put your fingers in. Your, I'll wave again at the end of the story so you can take your fingers out. Basically, the way it works is, he, uh, you kind of get the idea, right? The way, he, way it works is that, there's our, there's our fella. He's got servos all over his body and he's standing in his pose. Let's say he's standing in this pose like this, all right, and we want him to move into this pose, let's say. So the computer says, right, servos, move from position 645 to position 212. So the arm kind of comes down like this. Now, say he's in high wind or the servo isn't working properly, then you can see where this is going, can't you? Uh, then he usually gets told to go back and do it again. Um, We got a call a little while ago uh, from the man, from the woman who was responsible. She said, you've got to come down here. You have got to come down here. This, this, this is not good. So Neil and I were like, cool, all right, fine. So we, got, we went down there. Anyway, he was in this position. He was supposed to be in this position. Wind had blown him too far. And he'd gone back a bit and then it had gone too far. And then he'd gone back at it. And he was just idly. Now, I've got to tell you, I couldn't get up the ladder. Neil couldn't get up the ladder. It was the, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And he just had this little smile on his face and he was just. Uh, So, yes, we made the wanking statue outside of Tate Modern. Thank you. <laughs> He's, um, there's, there's something that these photos don't show. He's actually got a Latin inscription. Of course he does. Um, in fact, he has six. We made six, wood, six stone tiles that we swap in and out. Um, and the one on there at the moment is quid quid latin dictum sit vedetta est, which translated means anything written in Latin sounds clever. Uh, was, um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, yeah, we just did a recent project in Trafalgar Square, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And there's been a big debate about who pays for it. If, if an artwork is made and it's been paid for by Pepsi, you know, does it make it less of an artwork? Um, and this is a debate, probably not for here, but uh, for out there, when, you know, when we're finished. I, you, artworks have always been commissioned by people with money. That's how it works. The Medici's did it. Everyone, everyone does it. How you deal with that logo or their desire to turn your artwork into business is where the, is where the clever bit goes. And our clients and brands are getting better and better and more sensitive at realizing that if you make an artwork, but you make it out of thousands of the, of the product, you know, so it has the logo all over it, it's actually a very heavy-handed way of letting the world know how cool you are for commissioning the artwork in the first place. Um, You know, and I'm not naming any names, but there are, you know, s consumers, we are sensitive. We are sophisticated consumers now. We know, we know we're being sold to. And the artwork always seems to have more value when the artist has full control, or at least has as much control as possible. And so we've been, we've, and over the last couple of years, we've been approached more and more by brands. Brands who've said, We'd we love your work. We'd love you to do a project with us. We'd very much like to, to make something happen. And we're, we're not going to make, we're not going to write Nokia all over it. We're going to just let you do your thing. And at the end of it, we're going to go and it's been brought to you by Nokia, for example. And that's a much more sophisticated, delicate and sensitive way of, of making the work happen. And we've been lucky enough to have a couple of commissions like this. And I want to just show you a few. This is, this is uh, one of my faves. 
paint. It's a very, very simple project. Basically, we give you a bucket, and the bucket appears to be empty. But you can take a photograph, and, and the bucket appears to catch that photograph in the bucket. You can then take your bucket and throw your face all over the walls. All over this, this is us building up the screen that we were going to use it on, but in actual fact, we can do this on, that's, that's a splat. Splat. So you can see, she's taking a, taking a, now Nokia were cool, they were like, don't, you don't have to use a phone if you don't want to, but we thought it would be kind of cool, you know, everyone's got one of these, uh, although they probably wouldn't have been happy if we'd have pulled out an iPhone at this point when I was uh, trying to demonstrate it, but basically now what he's doing is he's throwing paint by just flicking his phone like this. And there was a second, that's a, uh, Good looking Neil there, having his photograph taken, putting it into the bucket. And now he's gonna splat it all over the wall. That's it. And what was nice as well is that you could throw paint on this wall from wherever you were in the world. You could take your face and then you could blow your face all over the wall. There, you get the idea. Splat. It was a really lovely project and they were particularly cool about us um, Really just supporting phones, supporting people, supporting the ability to create wherever, whoever, and whatever kind of consumer you were, which was a really fantastic thing for us. That's him blowing on the screen. Anyway, you get the idea. That was called paint. Um, it, was a, that was a, it was a satisfying project. It was very nice. Thank you. And this is the last thing we did just two weeks ago. We just finished this. Um, there was a lot of uh, online debate about whether or not this is true, but officially, according to some scientists, the most depressing day of the year is January the 23rd. Okay, just thought I'd tell you that. It's, the, uh, it's a Monday. Well, that makes sense. It's January. Oh man, this isn't going to work in South Africa, is it? No, okay, let me rephrase that. The most depressing day of the world anywhere else apart from Cape Town is, <laughs> is January the 23rd, especially in the Northern Hemisphere because it's grey, it's raining, there's no sun. Like it was, what was it, 28 degrees today? Yeah, no, it's not like that at all. And it's usually raining. And also you've got all the bills from Christmas, but you haven't been paid. You've got another week to, to, to be paid. So it's officially the most depressing day. We thought it would be a really good idea to create a, a sun in London that would give London an extra few hours of sunlight um, in order to sort of reverse this. And uh, this, is, this is what we did. Every time I look at you, I smile. It's a 200 ton crane with a two and a half ton sun, 260,000 watts of electricity. My megalomania went mental on this one. Um, it was a one day installation. I'm just going to show you the time lapse of it. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, we, we had to work like nutters to really get, uh, get the thing going, but let's just show you. Having access to Trafalgar Square was amazing. Pressing buttons and switching the fountains off. And that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's us arriving and that's the crane picking it up. It was the second highest trending topic on Twitter in the whole world for two days. Uh, 750,000 views of the video uh, in 48 hours. It was kind of crazy. It was, we were never expecting that. It was, it was really, uh, really, I think the bottom line was, you know, everyone's got phones now. You can tweet everything. It, it was really difficult to take a bad photograph of this just because of, you know, a, it, you know, it was a big, warm, friendly sun in the middle of the square. Um, you can just see us sort of testing, putting it all together. We actually, this is not time-lapse, we actually moved that quick. Um, we, uh, we're just, we're, we're a very, very, very fast group of artists. Um, and there it is. Oh, that. You know, um, people swore blind that they could feel the heat of it on their face. Um, there was no heat at all, none. Um, but this is just really interesting, the psychological effect that a sun has. You know, you suddenly just, you know, it gave people that, that moment of pause and, and uh, a sense of, of warmth. And we were really, really, really chuffed to, to have been able to do it. This one is just... 
I don't really know why, why we came up with this idea initially, but we got asked to do a project in the north of England. Giant trees, huge oaks. Suddenly they've sprouted huge clockwork keys. Like the first chapter in a story, what happens when you turn the keys? You can see that most of these trees were not viable, so we could drill holes in them. We haven't killed, no trees were harmed in the making of this artwork. Um, <laughs> But it was very important to us that, that that's true. And, it, but, and those that, there were a few that were living, but we worked with an arborist to make sure the tree wasn't in any way kind of uh, inconvenienced. Um, <laughs> but you realise you realize during these things that actually that tree is going to be around a way longer than you are. And because some of them are growing, actually that, that key will rise up over the next 100 years. You know. um, in fact, we, we were told about, um, about one of the trees that they'd got taken down the sawmill and this tree, this old oak tree, was 700 years ago, and it was 700 years old, and it was huge, huge, great big thing. And they had one of these electric saws, and they were kind of bringing it down to cut it. Um, and suddenly the, the, the saw exploded, you know, and they were like, shit, what, what, are they, what, are they hit? what are they hit? And they looked inside, and very, very slowly, over the, next, over the last 100 years, the tree had grown around a lawnmower. <laughs> and there was a lawnmower that had been enclosed in this oak tree. I mean, it just gives you a, kind of a, a sense of exactly what it is that we're dealing with when you deal with these trees. They're just way cooler than we are. <laughs> I'm just going to show you this, and then I'm going to finish with one tiny little project, and then, and then we're done. I just want to just want to show you what happened when you turn the keys. It was a proper clockwork mechanism. Clockwork wind up music box. Sexy. Don't know why. Lovely. Magic. Tiny little hidden music boxes all through the canopy, both in the trees, up above you, and in the floor begin to play. And there are these keys dotted everywhere. Some of them, like this one, are very easy to see. Others are high up in the canopy that you can't get to. And there are some keys that are tiny for very, very small people that, that are hidden in very, very small parts of the forest. So you realise that you're in this wonderful, magical place. This is, we like to think of this as the first chapter, really, of a story that hasn't been written yet. And this is called Clockwork Forest. It's, thank you. Okay. Last one, last one, last one. I've always wanted a tail. I, uh, I, I think that I deserve a tail. I, uh, I'm the kind of guy that would wear a tail. This is a fully animatronic tail. Uh, they are currently available. Uh, this is, um, look, basically we all want a tail. There's no point in denying it. I know you all want tails. Um, you're meeting the bank manager. You're being very serious. Hello, Mr. Bank Manager. I'd like an overdraft. Your tail, however, is knocking the pencils off the table. It's pinching girls on the bum. It's basically doing all of the naughty things that you want to do, but don't dare. This is a trip to Tesco's, uh, which is a supermarket in London. Uh, now, please bear in mind that this is Shoreditch in London. This is the ultra hip, ultra trendy part. Look at this guy's reaction. Absolutely nothing at all. Um, of course he saw it. He wanted a tail too, but, but he's too cool to admit it. Anyway, what, what's amazing about these things is, is how an extension like the tail is actually um, quickly read as a sort of an emotional extension to your personality. You can see here, the male model looks at the magazine and Oh, no, that's not very good. Down goes the tail. Whoop! Oh, much more interesting. Up comes the tail. And you begin to, you begin to read it. Um, we, every time I, I, I do a talk, and I, I generally show, show these, people kept saying, can I, can I get one? So we started to make these. Um, if you'd like one, just log on to Grey World. And there's uh, some friends of ours just chilling, um, having a little piece of kind of happy looking out the window, having a smoke, having a wag. You know, that's what you do. Uh, um, I think it's. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, this is what life is like at Grey World, really. You come in in the morning, you stick your tail on. Uh, uh, she, ooh, she, no, she doesn't like that. No, that's not good. Oh, I think he's having more fun than she is at the moment. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's Grey World. I hope you liked it. Thank you very much.